Welcome to our study tonight. Tonight, we are going to begin, well, we're going to start studying Psalm 118. And I titled it tonight, Lord of Mercy. Uh, the, this is an amazing story. Psalm 118 itself is an amazing story. A key verse is 118.8. It's the exact middle verse of your Bible. Matter of fact, everybody's Bible. Let me show you just a couple things about it. There are 15,586 verses before it. There are 15,586 verses after it. Uh, 1,189 chapters uh, with, uh, before it, 1,189 chapters after it, with Psalm 117 being the middle chapter. But let me give it to you this way. Psalm 118.8 is the exact middle verse in your Bible. There are 15,586 verses before it, 15,586 verses after it, as I said. There are 1,188 chapters before it, 1,188 chapters after it. Now watch this. So 1,188, it actually is 118.8. Is that a coincidence? I don't think it is. I think this is really planned by God. And there's a lot of things going on in this chapter that tells us that. So, if you leave out the middle chapter, there are 1,188 1, total chapters before it and total chapters after it. Again, 118.8. So, just look at this key ver verse, what it says. Uh, Psalm 118.8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now, some people would tell you confidence and trust are synonyms. They're not. Uh, especially spir spiritually and scripturally, and I'll show you that tonight. There is a huge difference between trust and confidence. Trust is the Hebrew word kaha, and it means refuge or hope or ultimate protection. Confidence is batach, and it means to look for help but not so secure. We put our confidence in a great number of people and things, but we must be very careful where we put our trust. And so tonight, that's what this is going to be talking about. So why are trust and confidence so different? Because trust, once used, is almost perfect in its application, making no sense in its logic. Just follow me tonight for a moment. While confidence is all based on logic and may not always have a great application. So let me illustrate it for you. Confidence first. Confidence is faulty at best. The American painter John Sargent was absolutely brilliant as a painter. He was born in Florence, Italy, and he painted portraits mainly, but he also captured architecture and sites of interest. He moved to New York City in the late 1920s. Most of his work is in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. Let me show you some of it. Now, before I get there, let me give you a little bit about trust, because I don't want to skip these, these charts. Trust in Proverbs is Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not into your own understanding. Proverbs 28, 25. He that is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he that puts his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. So notice the security of trust. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust into him. Protection. Proverbs uh, 31, 11. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so he shall have no need of spoil. If you go on for confidence, Proverbs 21, 22. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and casts down the strength of the confidence thereof. People who had confidence in themselves. And Proverbs 25, 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. So obviously scripture is telling us that trust is so much better than confidence. Confidence is fleeting. Trust is something that's very, very secure. So as I've been telling you, and as I skipped ahead a little bit, uh, the American painter John Sargent was absolutely brilliant as a painter. And uh, he, again, he was born in Florence, Italy, and he painted primarily his portraits is what he's known for. And he moved to New York City in about 1920s. And this, some of his art is in the Metropolitan Museum of Natural Art. And here's what some of his paintings are. And again, these are not photographs, these are paintings. And so, really pretty, very, very talented. You would think that's a photograph, that's a painting. Now, but John Sargent suffered from his own insecurity and his confidence in his ability was shaky. He had no confidence in his work. He once painted a panel of roses that was highly, highly prized by, by uh, critics. It approached near perfection, they all said. Although offered a huge price to sell it on many occasions, he did not. Stuart refused to sell it a you know, almost a dozen times. He considered it his best work and was very, very proud of it. So what was the reason why he wouldn't sell it? Well, whenever he was deeply discouraged about his painting and doubtful about his abilities as an artist, he would take it out, he would look at it, and he would remind himself, I painted that. Then and only then, his confidence and abilities will come back to him. Can you see it? His confidence could be up or down, but he trusted in that painting. Big difference. His confidence would, would vary back and forth, but his trust is in something he actually did. 
it stayed true to do what it did in his life. So his trust in that painting constantly brought him back out of his insecurity and allowed him to keep painting. He had said on one occasion, I would have stopped painting a long time ago if I didn't paint that and pull it out every now and then to see what I was able to do. So then, trust is permanent and confidence is floating. Trust is automatic in the thing you trust. It's just right there. You don't have to think about it. Confidence can be floating. It can be unsure. It can be unstable at times. One day, while my son Mark and I were out in the woods behind our house in Pennsylvania, when he was about five years old, he was climbing around some rocks and uh, just kind of going up and down some cliffs. And uh, I heard a voice from above me yell, hey dad, catch me. I turned around to see Mark joyfully jumping off a rock straight at me. He had jumped and then yelled, hey dad. I became an instant circus act, catching him. Uh, we both fell to the ground for a moment and after I caught him and I could hardly talk because it took me so much by surprise. <laughs> When I did find my voice again, I, ga I, gra I gasped in, in ex <laughs> exasperation. I said, Mark, can you tell me the reason why you did that? Obviously, I was a little stronger than that. He responded with remarkable calmness. He said, sure, because you're my dad. That's all he said. His entire trust assurance, and assurance was based on the fact that his father was trustworthy. How he could, he could live life to the, to the fullest and to the hilt and take even chances because I could be trusted. Isn't it even more so for a Christian to be like that? So now you may be getting the picture. So let's go a step further. If I had known what Mark was going to do beforehand, I would have stopped him, obviously, and I would have warned him or said, don't do that again, or Mark, next time I won't catch you, in order to scare him. Literally take his trust away in that situation, because I didn't trust myself when I turned around. But God knows what we're going to do before we do it, where we're going to jump blindly and when. He knows that beforehand, even when we're wrong, in our own timing. And God always catches us. That's what his word tells us. That's called his mercy, to catch us even when we do things that we shouldn't be caught. Psalm 118, I told you all this, because Psalm 118 is a psalm of trusting in the mercy of God, who will never let you fall flat when you jump into his hands, even if the timing is wrong, and will always let you fall flat when you jump into the hands of men, including when you jump into your own hands and you trust yourself. So in short, God wants to kill your confidence and trust in man and in yourself. Let me repeat that. God wants to kill your trust, or excuse me, kill your confidence and your trust in man or in yourself and replace them with one word and one action, trusting in him. So Psalm 18 is a psalm of mercy in order to build up our trust in God. It doesn't sound like it fits together, but you'll see it does. Our outline is this, Lord of mercy, mercy in distress, mercy in battle, and mercy in praise. Let's talk about mercy in distress. Verses one through nine. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endures forever. You can trust in his mercy. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. That is a lasting trust. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endures forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endures forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. We'll talk about that word in a moment. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord takes my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust, there it is, in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Don't miss that verse. That's, our whole, that's the whole context of what I want to talk to you about tonight. It is better to trust in the Lord, notice the juxtaposition here, than to put confidence in man. It's, point, it's pitting trust against confidence. We put our confidence in a lot of different things, but the Bible's telling us it's better to trust God than to put confidence in things that are around you. It's a pretty powerful psalm. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It says it twice, one in man, which is just your regular person that's the same as you, and people who are above you in authority or money or power or prestige. You don't put your trust in. Man, we need to hear that in America today as people look to politicians and they look to politics to try to, to and trust what they're going to say. That should be a pretty good indication for us that we're not to put our trust in man and we're not to put our trust in our confidence in man or our, conf or our confidence uh, in politicians or in princes. So mercy in distress is what it says. And along with all that I am uh, teaching you tonight, just remember this. The overall theme of Psalms is about Israel, the chosen people of God. Here in Psalm 118 is a type of review of how God helped her in times of distress. I'm not going to give you the prophetic side of, what, of 2018 because this is, these are halal psalms. These are psalms that are praising God 
And basically, did they have to trust God? Uh, Israel, of course, in 2018, they had enemies on every side. So I can give you one occasion after another, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go right into the psalm. So how God is helpful to Israel in times of distress and battle, which obviously they were going through in 2018, and it results in his praise, is what this psalm says. So notice the threefold mercy uh, admonition. It's this way. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. National state of Israel, the physical nation that must rely on God's mercy to exist since 1948, by the way. His mercy raised her from the ashes of the Holocaust and 2,000 years of non-existence. That's God's mercy. House of Aaron had a trust in it. Israel is mentioned in Psalm 118, House of Aaron. Let the house of Aaron say his mercy endures forever. That's spiritual Israel. The office of worship, the priestly duties, the Torah, temple worship. Jerusalem was sacked in 70 AD. It was dead for 2,000 years. In 1967, in the Six-Day War, Israel captures and retains the original site of Solomon's temple. In 2003, all is ready to reestablish the temple worship. They had all of the, thi all of the pots made. They had all of the, all of the articles for the, uh, for the priests made in 2003, since 2003. So uh, they know that God's, God's pushing them to that spot, and they know that, and they feel it. And then those who fear the Lord, it says, let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. That's us today. So those three admonitions to, to fearing the Lord and saying about his mercy enduring forever, it's the church, the adopted sons of Abraham, who every day receive the mercies of the Lord fresh and new for our growth, our restoration, and our revival as individuals. So Psalm 118 tells us that Israel should trust in God and his mercy. It tells us that the spiritual Israel should trust in God and his mercy. And it tells us, obviously, us as adopted sons and daughters into Israel should trust in his mercy. Psalm 118.5 uh, zeroes in on one word. Listen to it. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Again, I can tell you in 2018, one of the, the years that parallels Psalm 118, that Israel physically was in distress. There were wars and skirmishes. There were, there were rockets being fired. It was just a, the same old, same old for them. And this psalm says, I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. So what does that mean? Well, the word distress, let's talk about that. As you're listening to me tonight, have you ever been distressed? Uh, there's a threefold definition to this. Let me give it to you from Webster's first, then I'll kind of simplify it for you. Uh, distress. Number first, uh, the first definition is a seizure and detention of goods of another as a pledge or obtain satisfaction of a claim by the state of the goods seized. Sounds a little confusing. I'll explain it. Second, pain or suffering afflicting the body, a bodily part, or the mind. Trouble is a synonym, a painful situation, a misfortune. The third, a state of danger or desperate need, like a ship in distress. Again, synonym, synonyms, suffering, misery, agony, means the state of being in great trouble. Distress implies an external and usually temporary cause of great physical or mental strain and stress, like the hurricane put everyone in distress. So the threefold definition is this, the seizure and detention of the goods of another as a pledge to obtain satisfaction by seizing those goods. They put you in distress in because distress they take something that's yours and they require you to do something to get it back. Second, pain or suffering affecting the body or bodily part or the mind. There's a lot of people today in distress because of physical ailments. There's a lot of people in distress because of mental ailments. And the third part is the distress is a state of just desperation. So now after hearing this, need, we need to ask ourselves tonight, if any distress is facing you right now in your life, how do you know if you're in distress? Well, clinical psychologists and medical uh, professionals tell us that we can know. Sometimes it may not be obvious, but here's some of the, some of the symptoms. You pass your duties and your work off to others. You have an inability to communicate. You have a loss of contact with reality. Repeated requests for special consideration or attention. And some, you withdraw from activities. You withdraw from friends. And some is, is a sign by moodiness. So you could just check yourself as I check myself tonight. Whether we're in distress now or, or we, we're not, I'm sure at some time in our life we have been. Psalm 118, 6 to 9 says this, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? He's talking about distress. The Lord takes my part. You notice that I have that in red. With them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Again, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So David's writing this psalm. And obviously someone who hates him, someone who's an enemy of his, is putting him in distress. This could be written because of Saul, who is, who is 
who was who was hunting him down several times. It could be written from from as his own nation turned on him and they followed Saul. So there's a lot of things that can be putting him in distress. You could think about about um, uh, Bathsheba. You could think about Uriah. You could think about the situation of getting someone pregnant as another man's wife. You could think about the think about murdering allow, allowing Uriah to be murdered. There's something, maybe several things that have put David in distress. And so let's say he's repented. Let's not talk about his sin. Let's talk about him now going to God and saying, God, what am I going to do with this distress? Let's talk about it as Saul pursuing, which most people think that's what this is written about. So is the mercy of God extended to someone in distress? Yes. Listen, there's nights that I wake up, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and uh, something's on my mind. It may not be something that would be, be really important during the daytime hours, but it's something that's bothering me. I know you can associate with this. At the darkest hours of the night are the times we wake up and we just can't get any satisfaction. And a lot of times it'll keep you up. Your mind keeps going and, and basically now you're stressed because you're not getting sleep. So it's just compounded over and over again. It's a part of anxiety. A lot of people go through it. I get distressed about things that I need to do. And I don't get distressed often, but when it happens, it's pretty devastating. Uh, things that maybe I need to take care of. Sometimes it can keep me awake. Uh, then lack of sleep as I said, puts me further in distress. Uh, thankfully, God has shown me a way to get out of that. And usually it's praying a psalm or, or praying it or seeking him. But in verse 1 to 9, there's a slight hint at permanent help for distressed Israel. Look at verses 6 and 7 again. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord takes my part. I want you to really see that. It's prophetic, by the way. With them that help me, therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Um, it, the word part there in the Hebrew means a large place. It means room to move around in. Because distress closes us in. All we think about is that thing that's distressing us. So what the psalmist is saying, the Lord takes my part. He gives me room and God comes in that room with me. You could think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Surely it must have been distressful to be thrown in a fiery furnace, but God took their part. Literally came there. There was one, that fourth one, looking like the Son of Man that was walking around. That's exactly what David's saying. He's saying, whenever I get to this distress and I call on God, basically the God of mercy, He expands what I'm thinking about and comes in. That's how I get out of my sleepless nights. I allow God to come into my, into my head and I allow Him to make, I make room for Him and He makes room for me. And really the distress is something that, that flees from me. And again, it works for me all the time. Now, that's what the psalmist is saying. It obviously has worked for him too. Then he talks about God's mercy in battle. He says, mercy in battle. All nations, think about Israel, all nations compass me about it. It was happening in 2018. But in the name of the Lord, will I destroy them? Now, this again is David. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Now, there's a lot packed into those ver several verses there. Uh, let me give you a little bit about Israel. Israel is literally surrounded by aggressive Arab nations. The ones in yellow are, have a predominantly Arab population, Muslim population. Look at tiny little Israel. Tiny little Israel, and, and they want that land. I don't understand the mentality there. Why would you, want, why would you have everything and then want something that's just tiny in, in uh, tiny little Israel? Well, let me give it to you this way. These are Israel's neighbors. These are the terrorist groups that surround Israel. Let me just tell you, there's Hezbollah and Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Hezbollah and Hamas, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Hezbollah in Lebanon. You have Al-Qaeda in the lands of Islamic Maghreb, uh, Ansar Beit al-Nadis, the Al-Qaeda linked. You have those in Africa. You have Boko Haram, which is down in Nigeria, Lord's Resistance Army, which is in Ethiopia, Al-Shabaab, which, which is in Eastern Africa. You have Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. You have Lashkar and, and Toyoba, uh, in Afghanistan, you have Lakhar Ed Jangi, you have Jawish al Muhammad, the Taliban, obviously in, in um, Afghanistan, Hez el Islami, uh, Gubadin, Hezbollah sponsorship, Al Qaeda in Iraq, Islamic State of Iraq, and the Levant. And so you have all these terrorist nations, or excuse me, terrorist organizations, they're literally surrounding Israel, wanting to destroy Israel. Think about how they're compassed about. That's what David's talking about. He's talking about being compassed about. What does, he what does he mean? Well, look at the verses. The verses are pretty amazing. It means surrounded by, by some other influences, this time aggressive influences. Tiny Israel, without trust in the mercy of God, would have been destroyed long ago. 
Look, the word compassed, how many times it re is in this verse, these verses. All nations compass me about. They compass me about. Yeah, they compass me about. They compass me like about like bees. And so David's telling him, he's feeling the crunch. He's feeling the push. The, the compass, by the way, is the same word we get for northeast, west, and south on a little dial. He's saying that every place I look on this compass, they're around me. They're all there. From David's day, it was literally true. He had the enemies around him. But now, that's magnified many, many times over because it's a larger area that's compassing him. So, have you ever been in a battle? Have you ever been surrounded? Have you ever felt that there's no way out? That's what this verse is, that's what this psalm is about. Have you ever faced unbelievable odds of things set against you? Look in verse 12, it says a battle. Uh, in verse, they cause me about like bees there, quench this fire of thorns in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. He's talking about a battle there. In verse 13, he goes even further and, and says something about it. It says that there's a lance and a sword that, 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 will, uh, that will thrust into them. We'll read that in a moment. But, uh, let me show you just a couple things here. Psalm 118.12, the bees connection. He says the compass like bees. Listen to this connection. It's kind of, it's kind of off, the, off the mark a little bit, but I want to give you a little bit of the history. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Bees and thorns. They're two symbols used to typify Antichrist, believe it or not. And listen to what it says. Bees first used in Samson's riddle and judges uh, with, with the Danites. His bees made honey in the carcass of a lion. Uh, prophetically, rabbis believe that someone from the tribe of Dan would kill the Lion of Judah. They believe the Antichrist will actually come from the tribe of Dan. At least 2,150 years ago, rabbis believed someone from the tribe of Dan would be the Antichrist. Could his symbol be the bee? Maybe, there's a sim maybe we're getting a little hint here. Joseph Smith of Mormon Church and bodyguard has bodyguards who are called Danites. When, when Utah, the Mormon state, was founded, they adopted the honeybee as their symbol. Let's go further. The, histor the historic tie goes all the way back to Greece. Spartans used honey as a sacrifice to their gods. Royal, royal jelly. Flavius Joseph records a letter from King of Sparta to the high priest at Jerusalem, claiming descent from the stock of Abraham. Uh, it is believed that his king of Sparta was a Danite from the tribe of Dan. According to Homer's Iliad, the first Spartan king was named Danus. He came from Phoenicia with his 50 daughters who were called Danades. They invented the cult of the mother goddess known as Diana. The people loved her, their king so much, they called themselves Danians before they called themselves Spartans. History records, they wore their hair long as a symbol of magical powers, just like Samson. The first Trojan was Dardanus, who built the city of Troy along with the Dandanel waterway leading from the Aegean Sea to the Black Sea. Four rivers empty into the Black Sea, the Danube, the Danister, the Daniper, and the Dan, or the Don. This is, this is way beyond coincidence. Uh, such usage of the word Dan may be clues to tracing this lost tribe. And by the way, they are lost today. I believe they're probably, they're probably in Greece. Listen, in, four, in AD 448, a Frankish king named Morovi claimed descent from the two Trojans and wore his hair long as a form of mystical power. He had 300 symbolic bees that lined his castle. They were returned from the tomb of his son in 1653 AD by Napoleon Bonaparte and used as a motif in Napoleon's reign. They belonged to the Habsburg dynasty, who were of the Morovian descent. This famous family provided the emperors for the Holy Roman Empire for 500 years in Europe. Uh, in fact, even today, all European royalty are cousins. They're all related to each other. Whether it's the Queen of England or it's a, or a Spain, King of Spain, could the future world dictator come from European royalty? Uh, they're called royal blood. So there's a lot of connection to this. Let me also throw this in. Uh, one of the biggest symbols in the Catholic Church, especially for the Pope, are bees. On his royal robe, he has clusters of three bees everywhere, a symbol of the Danites. And again, I want to bring you, that's a little bit more history than you probably need, but I'm bringing you back to what, what David said about these bees compassing him. So there's a pretty good tie-in, but he's talking about trouble. Uh, and in Israel, even today, they say that trouble comes from the north or trouble, or trouble comes from Dan. Uh, it's a popular saying. So uh, basically, we're watching this play out as we see this, this, uh, this psalm. Psalm 118.13, Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord has helped me. He's talking about a sword or a lance. His enemies have, have thrust at him. You can see the tie in there in scripture in John chapter 19. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, Jesus, and forthwith came out blood and water. 
And he that saw it bear record, and the record is true, and knows that he says it's true that he, you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him should not be broken. That's Psalm 22. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him who they have pierced. Also 22. Zechariah 12.10. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. That's a prophecy in Zechariah of Christ. So we're seeing this thrusting. The Lord is my strength and my song, Psalm 118, 14 says, uh, and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he has not given me over to death. A lot is packed into those verses. So let me sum it up before we go a little further tonight. So what's happening is David's in distress. He's calling out to God. He's saying things have compassed him. They've come around him and he's surrounded. He's calling on the mercy of God. That mercy is extended to Israel. Uh, physical Israel, it's extended to spiritual Israel. It's also extended to us. We see this piercing he talks about, that his enemies pierced him. We can bring that all the way over and fulfill that in Jesus, how the enemies compassed him about. In Psalm 22, many bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They compassed me. This is the same theme Christ went through, the same thing David went through, the same thing theme Israel's going through, and sometimes the same thing you may be going through right now. So the application is huge, and it's, it's applicable to every one of us. Now, uh, the, so the question tonight is this, again, are you under distress? Are you in distress of battle tonight? And just what is it you're battling? Is it your emotions or maybe your sense of well-being? Surely it's not nations around you, but it might be some battle. How about your weight? <laughs> How about your insecurities or, your, or your, your finances or your family or yourself or maybe even your friends or your job? We go through a lot of different battles. It's all relative to us. Are there some things you're good at fighting and some things you're absolutely poor and terrible at fighting? i be honest with you, I love games, and I'm switching here, but just follow the logic. I'm usually, and I'm not going to be prideful here, but I'm usually pretty exceptional at games, except a couple of them, like mm -hmm. this one. It's called Battleship. That one in Stratego, an older game. Battleship is absolutely one of my worst games. I do not like to sit down and think of the logic. I want to attack. Uh, Cheryl and I used to play that when we were first married, and I never won. Not one single time. No matter how many times we played it, I never won. And it's really hard for me not to win something. I used to beg her to let me win. <laughs> I used to ask her to show mercy. There it is again. The mercy of God can actually strengthen you in battle. It's what Psalm 118 is all about. God's mercy. You know you can't win, but you know someone who will fix it for you so you can win. Lastly, the third part of this is here. Let me get back to it if I can. Mercy and praise. Doesn't seem like those two go together, but watch. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. The gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee for thou hast heard me. Thou art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, O I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Thanks and mercy. Now, let me just set you up for the last part of this, because it's pretty powerful. It's an unusual type of ending to this psalm. It's actually prophetic. It's talking about Jesus. It's talking about him being, and I'll, sh I'll go over what it says, but it's talking about him being the answer to all of our battles. It's talking about no matter who compasses us about, that Christ can help us. It's an unusual, I call it mercy praise. Worshiping God with an intent to extract his mercy. Look at it. The gate, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. A gate, wherever do we hear that before? Well, the gate, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is all prophetic towards the end of it. So David's in distress. He says Israel can be in distress physically. Spiritually, they can be in distress. We, as, as the rest of us, can be in distress. We need God's mercy. Sometimes Israel's compassed about physically. Sometimes they're compassed about spiritually, which they are by the now, right now. They're very secular. And sometimes we're compassed about spiritually. So what's our answer? Well, the answer is he's calling on God, and he's calling on his mercy. There is no greater mercy than Jesus. 
No greater mercy. We all deserve to die and go to hell. Every single one of us. Israel deserves to be destroyed because they're, they're wicked just like everybody else is. But God has made promises and in his mercy, he has sent Christ. Israel right now is 88% secular, as I told you. But they're going to have an opportunity to call on Christ. But he says, this gate, this gate, look, let me bring it back. to This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the gate. It's a, prophetic, it's a prophecy of him. Look at this in verse 22. The stone which the builders refused to become the head, corner of the, uh, head of the corner. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus became the cornerstone. He's the rock that's there. And boy, it goes a little further. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. Jesus was bound. Bound to the cross. Just like that lamb was bound to that altar. This whole end of this psalm is a prophecy about Christ being our answer when we're in distress and when we're surrounded by things. This psalm was written a thousand years before Jesus came and died for all of us. Tonight, it all boils down to two words that I believe are opposite. The dictionary places them as synonyms. I spiritually see them as antonyms, opposites. Confidence is fleeting. It's up and down. It's temporary. And it's always in dealing with man. But trust, it's lasting. It's stable. It's permanent. And it's only used really in its fullest form, truest form, when dealing with God. I learned about trust learning to fly in a Cessna 172 airplane. I learned about trust when I was a co-pilot in an F-4 jet. Let me tell you about the 172. There's no situation I can get into that God cannot get me out of, and I believe that. So some years ago when I was learning to fly, my instructor told me to put the plane into a steep and extended dive. I was totally unprepared with what was about to happen. After a brief time, the engine stalled and the plane began to plunge out of control. It soon became evident that the instructor was not going to help me at all. He just sat there. After a few seconds, which seemed like an eternity, my mind began to function again. I quickly corrected the situation. Immediately, I turned to the instructor and I began to vent my fearful frustrations on him. But he was very calm and he said to me, there is no position you can get this airplane into that I cannot get you out of. Uh, if you want to learn to fly, go up there and do it again. At that very moment, God seemed to be saying to me, Remember this, as you serve me, there is no situation you can get yourself into that I can't get you out of. If you trust me, you'll be all right. That lesson has been proven true and true, true over and over in my ministry and many times in my life. The question tonight is this, can we have confidence in, in man alone? Can we have confidence and trust in this, the cross? Can you put your trust in the empty cross, because that's what it is. I wrote two poems for you tonight. One of them is very long, and the other one is very short. Let me give you the long one. Trust, your mouth, your lips, your words so pained, the hurt is all you know. Seems sorrow ebbs with tears so stained as down your face they roll. I've seen it at the cross as I've seen it in your eyes. It is the quiver of your voice and the muffle of your cries. The twins of hurt and pain are with you always there. Born in you they grow, despite your earthly care. They live and breathe and beat, distressing from within, with every heave of your heavy heart, reminding of begotten sin. I can feel you always with me, distant yet ever so near. Your touch is fresh upon me when believing your words I hear. My pain seems never a moment of rest. It sorrows deeply with nothing to gain. When it lessens and I feel the best, it comes down again like a summer rain. I must now lift my voice to heaven and sing the saddest song. Then receive a song from heaven, trusting mercy that will last my whole life long. Pain is life's reminder that confidence in man is loss, but mercy pushes on in me as trust is found upon a cross. So lead me, guide me ever still to fight this foe so fierce. Remind me of your painful hill where spear your side did pierce. And trust, will I, dare I, ever learn when from confidence in man and things about I turn? Lord, rewrite my life with mercy's pen Teach me trust in you, no matter when, where, or when. Finally, let me at your cross find rest, when rain and sorrow pose their test. As onward and upward in you I grow, let mercy and trust be the twins I know. That's what this psalm is about, mercy and trust. Shorter version is this. Trust them when the dark doubt assails thee. Trust them when thy strength is small. Trust them when to simply trust him seems the hardest thing of all. Trust him, he is ever faithful. Trust him for his will is best. Trust him for the heart of Jesus 
is the only place of rest. So tonight, where are you? Where's your confidence? Is it in your paycheck? Is it in your job? Is it in the security of someone telling you a promise? Is it in your government? Where is your trust? That's what we want to get to tonight. Our trust is in him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for what your scripture says, not to put our confidence in man, but to trust in you. And Lord, let us learn that. Let us learn that the sun doesn't rise and set on the place we, we work, that no one has a pink slip that's going to give us eternal turmoil. Lord, because you have saved us, you have rescued us, our trust is in you. Lord, no matter when one door shuts for us who are the righteous, Lord, you open another one. And almost always, it's far, far better. And if it's not, it's to teach us something, but you're always there with us. I pray, Lord God, that we realize that our trust in you is above everything else in our life. Help us to trust you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us tonight.